So my technique was to get on and off as quickly as I could. To spend too much time there, it's devastating. Absolutely devastating. That's where they sleep over here. Yes, it's the den. Let's thank you, Mom. They say you must not use the cameras. You're not allowed to use the cameras? Yeah. One of the most popular cats at the moment. We can't keep up with all the orders. Wow. We typically do a deal where it's, you know, you buy one male and you buy two females with it <laughs> thrown in. Do they hunt him as well? For me, part of the story, part of the narrative, is brutality. I certainly believe that this is a continuation of the brutal story of South Africa's past. I was riding horses with a very well-known operator in the Delta, and we used to share that concession with hunting operators. And Outside of the season, we kept, we would, we would often hear shots going off. And we'd hear small aircraft landing. Those shots we were hearing in those light aircraft were hunters operating illegally outside of the season. And that, that's really what got me going. It was about the time of the Cook Report, which was the first real exposure South Africa and the world had of what was actually going on. A canned hunt is where the target animal is unfairly prevented from escaping the hunter, either by physical constraints such as fencing, or by mental constraints such as being habituated to humans. I was involved with the Cook Report in the hunt that was featured on the Cook Report. And that was um, through sheer ignorance at the time, greed at the time, call it what you like. And the fallout from that was that myself and my family in particular have been branded with this tale of the, of the Cook Report and canned lion hunting. It's not a pleasant thing to have gone through. At the time, it was condemned by the entire industry, by the entire world. And all of a sudden, it's quite fine to do it now. Hi, I'm calling from the United States. And uh, I'd like to see about uh, doing one of your lion hunts. Uh, can you give me, can you talk to me? Yes, I can. Uh, what did you say was your name? My name is Rick. The hunting that I've done has been primarily to put food on the table. You get your deer tag at the start of the season, and you know, and you do a proper hunt. Our culture has held weapons in high esteem since our inception. Second Amendment rights to bear arms. I've got no qualms with that. I got the opportunity to see a uh, clip on canned hunting. Blasting away, blasting away. What disturbed me the most was the baiting of the animal. 
And just as he was about to take a bite, you know, the shots start going off. And it's not just one shot. Six shots. Six shots. I think that's what propelled me into this and made me want to find out for myself. We do know that about five, six years ago, the South African government did try and do something about the predator breeding and can hunting industry. And the government won the first round of cases, and that was well publicized, but they lost their appeal, and that wasn't well publicized. And so we have this perception amongst many people in South Africa that can hunting has been done away with. The fact that the Predator Breeders Association won the case is undoubtedly being used by them to say that, that, that what they're doing is legitimate, it's not unlawful. The canned hunting situation really falls through the cracks in our legislation. The disheartening point now is that, of course, government have done nothing since that court case was thrown out. And so today, in, in the, I don't know, four or five years since then, we've actually probably had a doubling in the size of the industry. Let's see what this one says. Well, I went online and took a look at a number of different websites. If you've got the money, you know, there's people here who will take it. I've got like a, um, you know, a limited amount of time that I that I'm gonna have free. Three, three days, two nights, we'll be fine for it. We'll be enough for the line on. Okay. Yeah, they came back with 14 animals, pictures of 14 animals. 13 of them were males, and one was a female. About sixteen thousand dollars for a young blonde mane male on up to 48,000 US dollars for one of the big black mane males. There are numbers from 1 to 14. Then you will see the darker and the more the mains are, the, the expensive they, they get. OK. Click. I want that one. Type off an email. Let me have that one. Bring your friend along uh, to take the DVD or the video. Right. So I can I can do a video on a sound guy without any problems. No, that wouldn't be a problem. Perfect. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Rick. You take it out. Goodbye. <sighs> Holy crap! Can hunting is all about a quick, easy kill for the hunter and it's about large profits for the operator. And so the best way to achieve both those goals is to breed lions intensively. It's very difficult to get information on these industries. So it's one thing to, to hear the stories or to suspect, but it's another to actually go in and see it yourself and to film it yourself. So that's what I did. The more, the more you interact with it, the more they will get used to you. But you never get a lion tame. Never. Was they born to be wild? That man's very black, eh? Hey? Yeah, it's very black, yeah. That's what makes it, you know, nice, a nice lion, you know, the, yeah. the blacker the mane, the more, the nicer they are. So I'm, I'm just put on the surveillance camera, um, just in case that uh, we end up with a little bit of a confrontation here. The owner just phoned me now and he said that we, unfortunately, we won't be able to do it, do it to any other. There's something wrong with the, with the, with the cruiser, with the vehicle. 
I'm just ripping it. Sorry about that. Hello. Hi, guys. I'd like to see is Mrs. Ingrid Swartz here. Um, no, she's not here yet. She's due to arrive any minute now. She went into town to collect milk. She was due to arrive around half past three. I know. Huh? I know. Yeah. He's going to tell us the three, three people are here. She's going to be a little more delayed in town, so she doesn't know really. She might be an hour or two. Hi, is that Ingrid? We just come to to chat about what you do here and what you're involved in. So there's no chance that you'll be back in the next short while. Another way they protect themselves is that they pass on information to each other about people who may very well be on their property filming and asking the right questions. So when we approached the first property, the owner of that farm was suspicious of us and very quickly he had phoned other farmers in the area and so when we arrived on the properties they already knew. Coming down this road now takes me straight back and I have very clear recollection of how awful this place was. Um. How are you? How are you? Thanks. Well, what do we pay to, to just have a look around? No, you don't pay and walk around because you are from the Greenish. We know you. You are from the Greenies from overseas, yeah. I don't know from where, but you are from the Greenies, so it's right. better for you to go away. It's much easier for us. But, because but yeah, we had a lot of phone calls. <laughs> Nature Conservation phoned us and told us this morning, you was by two or three people, you stay last night by your aunt, then you go to from the toy, and, and, and. And then you take okay. thousands of people, a, a photo. So no, I'm not argument anymore with you, so it's... Can you go, please? We want to see what goes on. We, I mean, these are open well, to the public. I'm really sorry, guys. But what is there to hide? That's the say, point. I give you two minutes to leave my, leave my property. Two minutes. Two minutes. I give you two minutes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, Nick. Nick, don't. Don't. It's exactly the same guy who I had an altercation with 12 years ago. And his attitude hasn't changed one bit. We're now on the property of Lion's Rock, which is the only true wildlife sanctuary in the Free State province. 12, 14 years ago, this place was actually one of the worst of the predator breeding operations. And it was one of the first places that I came to and was able to draw the link between the breeding that was going on and canned hunting. We um, did a sting on the internet they sold us a whole lot of animals, including a big male white lion for, back then, $130,000. And I was able to match the image they'd sent us and the picture that I took right here. They were selling this facility as an educational center and as a sanctuary. But I'd been tipped off that, in fact, it was a can hunting operation. And what I had to do was try and find where the actual breeding center was and I managed to get some information from one of the staff on the farm. And I just asked him, where would I find the, the breeding lines? And he said to me, take that road, which says strictly forbidden. That's where the farmer's house is. That's where all the lions are. Done some research on regular lion hunts, and they may take two, three weeks before they even get a shot off. Whereas what I'm doing is I get there on Monday, Tuesday I tour the place, Wednesday I get my line. 
It's like, bring them in, shoot them down, ship them off. It's entirely too easy. Is the industry still growing? It's definitely still growing, yeah. Remember, most of these predators are going into the hunting market. I mean, I can prove it with the amount of permits that are being issued at the moment. So, yeah, it's, it's a big industry. It's, it's a massive industry. Yesterday we visited a, a particular operator and they didn't like us being on their property. Nature Conservation phoned us and told us this morning you was by two or three That people. doesn't make sense to me. I mean, why would we as a department phone a private predator breeder and tell him don't allow those people there? I mean, the only deduction I can make is they must have something to hide. If you want to start a captive breeding facility for lion or for predators, all you need is the money to buy the land, to put up the fences and to apply for your permit. There are no requirements in terms of having any knowledge of animal husbandry, animal care, or any basic understanding of what lion behavior, lion biology is. Unfortunately for lion, they breed relatively easily in captivity, and this has allowed the canned hunting industry to grow. They now need a ready supply of animals, uh, animals that are relatively tame and can be managed, and that can be profitable, so they need to be done in a very intensive situation. So groups of animals like this will be put into very, very small breeding camps, uh, and literally it just becomes a battery farming situation. If a lion is just a thing, like a table, uh, then there's no problem with buying and selling it and manufacturing as many as you can. The difficulty is when one defines everything that is not a human being or a corporation as property, that inevitably leads to the commercialization of nature and its exploitation. The cubs are then pulled from the mother at anything between three and 10 days and that is to bring her into oestrus again so that she's able to breed very, very quickly, a second and a third time. So she's breeding many, many more times in her life cycle than she would be doing in the wild. You're actually wearing her out, you're exhausting her. And there's also, it shows that the cubs bred under those intensive situations are becoming progressively weaker. They're not looking to have genetically healthy animals. They're looking to have as many animals as they can to pump into the industry. The stress that these uh, intensive bred animals live under is unbelievable. And we are sitting on a time bomb. It's not illegal, unfortunately. It's very unethical and completely against the animal, animal's welfare, but it's not illegal, and the lion farmers know that. So they generally do as little as humanly possible for these animals. Breeding wild animals is no sin. It is an international accepted norm. They, they, they do that with, with buffalo and with roans and with sables and with, with, with crocodiles, but no one complains about that. They complain about lions because this, the, the lion as a species has this special position in the mind of people. He is the king of the animal kingdom and he is the, the icon of wildlife. But that's only a perception in people's minds. Do you see any distinction between wild animals and domestic animals? For sure there's a distinction. Some of them are wild and some are tame. But in principle, there's no difference. You have to look at the purpose of what's being done. The arguments in favor of producing animals for food are completely different to the arguments in favor of producing animals for non-essential purposes, like uh, shooting them for trophies on the wall. The quality of wildness in itself, I think, is, is something worthy of protection. Are you or your department aware of how many lions are being kept right now on, on farms across South Africa? 
this is approximately 6,000 lines now in about 200 facilities in South Africa. The report is aware of certain segments in the international community that is um, opposed to um, certain activities involving captive bred lions. I do not think that the concerns relating to um, malpractices in the industry should overshadow this, the conservation success that South Africa has had, especially in terms of lions. So, I mean, in short, intensive breeding of lions is acceptable? It, it is a regulated activity, so yes, it is something that will be authorised, provided that certain conditions are met. The Department of Environmental Affairs can only legislate based on biodiversity threats. So, for example, if captive breeding of lions was leading to the extinction of wild lions, then they could change the laws. But because captive breeding of lions is causing animal cruelty, they can't do anything because it's welfare-based, and welfare falls to Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries. So it's this absolute mess. You have a national department that forms policy that cannot tell the provinces what to do. Passing the buck is exactly what applies to the legislation in this country. These are animals which ought to be wild, but because they've been removed from the wild, um, are effectively domestic, but aren't properly covered by the legislation dealing with domestic animals either. Okay, well now we've just found the turn of Juzan cheetah. Uh, which is a property just outside Bloemfontein. And I haven't been here before, but I uh, believe that they have a number of different species of cats, including lions, that uh, they are breeding. We don't breed. We maybe once every second year let her get a litter, but we do not breed because of all the speculations and people saying you're just breeding for hunting. <laughs> and we don't, that's, n that's not what we want. The cubs stay with her up until 10 days, and then we take them away. What's interesting here is that this is uh, pretense in a way that this is different, that they're a sanctuary, but um, halfway through the tour, it comes out that they are selling things like caracal and serval to Latatila Africa. So we're not 100% sure about their credentials. There's Milan and Sylvester. They will be also leaving us next week. They're going to Letzati Game Lodge, where they will be reintroduced back into the wild. It's very clear across the world that a proper sanctuary does not breed, does not trade, and it has no interaction. So I don't know how the majority of these properties can claim to be sanctuaries. In my ideal world, um, there would be no need for, for lion sanctuaries um, because there would be no abused lions in captivity. The huge difference between a bona fide sanctuary, which we are, and, and the majority of, of captive lion facilities in South Africa is that we have a strict no breeding policy. And then we also offer a lifetime home. We have a country where a large, large majority of people profess to be animal lovers and yet seem to be oblivious or uncaring to the fact that Every single day in South Africa, at least two to three captive bred and reared tame lions are being slaughtered in canned hunts. I've got two black birds, and I've got the white lions, and I've got brown lions, and the twingle tigers. These are the third litter of that uh, white female that was lying there. Okay. That's her first litter, the one lying there. Yeah. There wow. is the one of eight months. She's pregnant now again. Is she? Yeah. Captive well, How old are they? They, you know, I'm getting naughty. Wow. I take the lions away after one week because otherwise they're wild. Wow. You get a, a powder milk from the vet, but they don't like it, so I just give them normal um, cow milk, 
uh, with this you know. Uh, yeah. Because you know they're now like my dogs, you know. Oh, oh. Uh-uh. No, no. No, no. It's, I know, I know what you're doing. Yeah. So, so where do they go? What we want to do with him is people who want slants on the farm, but not for, not for hunting, just for... Okay. You know, you can make... Actually, it sounds terrible, but you can make a lot of money if you do hunting. I think a lot of these owners actually don't want to find out anything more. They actually love this concept that they have these wild animals around them and that they can play with these babies. about the money. It's about breeding wildlife as intensively as they can, as quickly as they can, to make as much money as they can. Predator breeding and cat hunting took hold in South Africa because there were a number of factors that were in place. One is we have private property laws. This is my land, I can do what I want to do behind these fences. Number two, biblical issues. There are a lot of people who point to the fact that man has dominion over all other species, and because of my religious views, I can do this. Thirdly is remember, a lot of these people involved in these operations came out of the apartheid era. And these are people who had no regard for human rights. So to ask them to make the leap from having no regard for human rights to consider the welfare or even have a consideration for animal rights, it's beyond their frame of reference. Maybe predator breeding, can hunting is one of the offshoots of that period in our history. So this, this is a female lion then, yeah? This is the female. Yeah. Just gotta unfold them. Wow. When I visited the uh, taxidermy place prior to uh, getting up to where I was to do my hunt, that place was incredible. I mean, they must have had the skins of over 1,500 animals. It's a half month, so we can't just look up space for it it's being hung on the wall, you know, jumping out as there were so many animals. <laughs> it was it was amazing to see. You know, a little bit disturbing. Mr. Gabriel, over there. He's got his hands extended out. He's gonna have a wooden tray on it for business cards. We do wonderful things for the open class. That one's dragging a it's a beautiful pose on the lioness. It's a very natural pose. That's what struck me about the lions that I saw in that taxidermy place. They weren't scraped up. They weren't scarred. A lot of times when you when you watch the videos, the males are just like all gnarly looking. You know, they've got scars on their nose because they've been fighting over either females or they've been fighting to take over a territory. They've got scars on them. These animals are pretty, like they were done up nice. They, they didn't have any bush history. I don't know how I'm going to react. I don't know what I'm going to feel. So I've never done this. You know, I've never 
been a part of this kind of thing. Saturday the seventh. Um, been I'm starting to record myself every day because I've got no idea how long I'm gonna be here. I wanna call this one named Boo. She's like a little angel. Yeah. So. Up to date, I've worked at two of these places. And the first time I've got introduced to these um, breeding farms, I thought that it was all for conservation and very ethical. It always been my dream to come to Africa anyway, but um, I got to a point in my life, I guess, where I got fed up with touristy holidays and I wanted to give something back. And I thought, well, I've always been a cat person. For 30 days, uh, you pay uh, me it was 2,800 US dollars. They would house up to 35 volunteers at the stage, and there's not a lot of work for all of these volunteers. When these overseas volunteers come there, what I've noticed is they're very blind to the fact of what is really going on, of what I've picked up working at one of these places for a year. Well, at first, I thought it would it was amazing, you know, how we could get uh, interaction with it, with them. So weird. But the more I got into this, I just I just see and notice that there's something that's not right about this place. These places were saying that they were taking these lines and putting them back into nature and it was also that the, li the lions are on decline in Africa and they're using these breeding projects to put them and house them back into conservation. And when do you take them away from the mamas? We usually do it at uh, about two weeks, um, but these guys were an exception. We took them off for uh, three days. The cubs are then taken away and that produces another whole industry in itself in that you then have these orphaned cubs that are put out on adoption, that become part of these intensive volunteer programs and young keen volunteers come in and believe that they are rearing an orphan lion cub and that they are contributing to conservation. When in fact, in many sad cases, all they're doing is rearing a cub that when the right age and no longer good for photographs and to pay and play, then gets put into a hunting situation. Once the, the handling stops in a certain age, these lions are so still used to humans, it's actually dangerous. That's why they don't clean the enclosures that much. They haven't been cleaned in a few months, I would say. Two months, three months. It's Sunday, it's feeding time. As you can see these seven lions in this small enclosure. It's just harsh to see this actually. A lot of the food was donated, so there were a lot of um, cow carcasses. But to my knowledge, none of those carcasses were ever assessed to find out whether they'd been on antibiotics, whether they'd been ill, how long they'd been laying in the field before they were picked up. So, you know, who knows what what we were passing on to the animals. The worst memory that I have is this three-week-old cub in his cat box um, screaming for attention and his mom. And this cub had to be taken care of every three to two hours for bottle and nobody worried about this, and this cub would constantly scream for his mom until it doesn't seize, okay, there's no hope, and it will just stop and lay there for the whole day. 
Those poor volunteers think they're really doing something for conservation. In the meantime, they're just looking after the predator owners' animals and hand rearing them and giving them milk and they sleep with them and that type of stuff. I mean, that's not conservation. Far too many students are coming in on this paying system because it's become a massive industry. The most common question asked by people on arrival here is if they're lion cubs that they can pet. Of course, they get our standard response of no and an explanation as, as to why we don't have lion cubs. It, it's actually quite shocking how many people then leave because um, they're after that quick fix. Everyone wants to pet a lion cub, everyone wants to play with a lion cub. They want to photograph of themselves on Facebook with the lion cub. And the woolies pulled over their eyes. They have no idea in many cases. This is just a normal walking stick. Please don't hit the lion, throw the lion, poke the lion with the stick. It's just if you feel uncomfortable, if the lions come walking to you, you put the stick between you and the lion. They learn this sign means stop for them. You'll see the lions are like models. They like it when people take pictures of them. <laughs> you guys can go and touch the lions if you want to, to get the nice Facebook profile pic. <laughs> How old are they when they get here? About a week, two weeks old. We get them so young so that they can respect us and they know us very well as if we are their parents. We start um, walking with them when they're about four and a half months old. We show them what to do and where to lie and get used to the meat stick. Why do you do that? What a nice picture that their oh, eyes are open. Okay. Okay, so everyone, then we can say thank you to the lions and to the handlers thank and they'll you. take them back to the camp. Go back to the building. Why did you come to work on a on a place like this? Because we don't have lions in Germany. <laughs> it's really it's amazing. The wonderful experience. Can feed them and can I stimulate them? I can touch them and hear the sound in yeah. the night, the roaring. Yeah. It's like an earthquake. I'm always very happy when I hear it. So but how many lions have you got here? I think it's around 120 at the moment. If you're holding them and they don't feel like you're keeping them tight, just let them go and let them run around, let them explore. You're more welcome to touch them. How many volunteers? Uh, we have what? about 25, 25 on this. 25 volunteers, okay. Yeah. So yeah, they usually adopt a cup, then they they pay an amount of money in each year for the food and the vegetables and all that. Um, we keep, keep them updated how the cup is doing, sending pictures and all of that. And then usually they come back the next year and walk with their lion. Do you all volunteer? Yeah. Norway. Norway. All from Norway, and you? okay? Norway. All Norway. All Norway. And how long have you come for? Two weeks. Two weeks. And we paid 12,000, I think. Yeah. No, we should go. Well, that's what mainly what, what Ukatula is all about, is about our research. We are working hand in hand with many universities also around the world. Um, South Africa, we've got um, the Poort, we've got uh, Germany. Germany, we've got... Uh, no. I can't remember, they, all the letters are there in the, in the office as well. We have a, a project on lions, which is the two elements of it. The one is about TB in lions and how this might be affecting the lion population. And the other one is understanding the reproduction of lions. Probably 20 to 30 lions are needed in order to undertake those um, neuroendocrine studies. If you ask me, are they breeding lions in order to have more lions to do something else with them, I have absolutely no idea. So you have no idea where the older lions from Ukutula go? I mean, I would hope that, that they are housed and looked after until their old age and in their dotage they die. 
but I don't know what actually goes on and I don't think it's my business to get involved in that. If I was aware at all that lions were mishandled in Ukatula in a way that I saw as being unacceptable, I would have nothing to do with conducting my research in that environment. Okay. Sometimes we put them in their own enclosures, sometimes we sell them to other breeding centers and predator parks all over the world. But before we sell our lions, we first find out what's the issue of that place. Lots of research going in into that. And they're also signing a contract saying they're not involved or will ever be involved in any canned lion hunting that's taking place. So we try everything possible to keep our lions safe where they go. But why have you got so many? It's just for the research. We're not breeding lions for tourists. It's just for research. Um, the tourists that's coming in is just a byproduct. I just you want more. I didn't want to do that in front of everyone. I saw you with the video camera. Uh, just if you use any of your footage onto your social media or anywhere, if you can just uh, contact us so that we can give you a release. For, we've had uh, instances where our footage has been used and we've been misrepresented. The feedback we get from most of these facilities is that we don't breed and that we're not involved in can hunting. So of course that begs the question, where do all these cubs come from? And where do all these older lions go? There is no conservation value breeding lions in captivity. And I think it's time that the guys who are involved in that were actually honest and said, this is a commercial venture. Don't try and call it conservation. Don't try and pre pretend that it's saving lions in the wild. It is a very brutal commercial operation where you are mass producing animals that you then have a number of uses for. A lot of my work has been based on informants. And about five, six years ago, I got a call from a policeman someone who works within the Wildlife Crimes Division, and he told me about the blind bone trade. The whole lion bone trade is based on age-old concepts of traditional Chinese medicine. They had a whole section dedicated to what they call tiger bone wine. And really what that meant was taking a tiger carcass, submersing it in a liquid, and that fermented, and the potion that came off that was then sold as a medicine. The Chinese banned the trade in tiger pots back in the early 1990s. And so there has been a scarcity of bones of tigers to go into these vats. In the past two years, the lion bone industry has boomed. People have even started digging up lion bones of lions that were hunted, let's say, 20 years ago. We're on a weekly basis issuing CITES export permits for oh, between 70 and 150 carcasses that actually leave the country. We're aware of the lion bone trade um, and the extent of it. At the moment, the department regards it as a, a sustainable activity. The bones are obtained as a byproduct from the lion hunting industry. When you're doing canned hunting and you captive breeding predators for that, the animals have to be in at least a certain reasonable condition in order to be acceptable to the hunter. So there has to be a certain level of welfare for that animal to look okay. When it comes to breeding for lion bone, it actually doesn't matter what the lion looks like. So the welfare standards around that are even worse. Hi there. My name is Rick. Rick, welcome nice to meet you. Welcome you guys. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. I'm going to show you guys your rooms. All right. And uh, you can have something to drink. 
So you got uh, folks from all over the world then, I take yeah. it, huh? Yeah, yeah. American, European, Czechoslovakia, Russian guys. In about two days, we've done 23 planes games and two lines. Wow. Wow. So you were quite busy. Yeah, welcome. Thank you. Nice. you. Welcome. Thank you. Appreciate it. Cheers. Hi guys, it's uh, 5.20 in the morning, heard the lions roaring off in the distance, have that butterfly thing happening, but each time I have to get myself settled back down and, uh, you know, focus on what I gotta do here. How's it? My name is Rick. Hey. Eric, nice to meet you. Now we're about ready to head off and do some target practice. Uh, see how well I shoot. You know, we went out into the bush initially to try and understand Africa, the real Africa, and found predators, first of all, so I fell in love with lions. These big predators drive everything else below them. And when I started discovering that, I realized that if you pull a lion out of a system, there's the potential for these large ecosystems to collapse. We've lost 95% of our lions in 50 years. We're losing a rhino every 10 or 11 hours. It's a bloodbath out there. This stuff will be gone before we even know it. And it's much more important than we think. It affects the very fabric of this continent. If we say to our children, think a hundred years when you are long gone, <coughs> would you be happy to hear that there is no lion in an African bush? And then once they feel the sadness of it all, only then can they be able to step up and, and play a role and play their part in conserving our animals. the forefront of the whole um, effort for lion conservation. A lot of people talk about conservation, but hunters are the real um, conservationists. The most effort, the most money, those are the people that are actually in the field. That's what Safari Club does. Safari Club brings all those people together, gives them um, goals, gives them commonality, gives them um, something to work towards. So Safari Club International is the largest, certainly American hunting organization. Uh, some people even refer to it as the largest global hunting organization. Literally, the A to Z of trophy hunting is on display at those conventions. And then of course you'll have access to hunters who can tell their stories. Um, and one of these is our lifetime membership with the Phoenix chapter. One is lifetime member of SCI. One is um, Hunter Legacy Fund, the patrons. This is the World Hunting Award ring. 29 major awards. Of course, I know more than anybody. I think South Africa is most probably one of the only places in the world where we breed lions commercially. And we breed them for hunting. And there's a lot of controversy about this issue. People that are non-hunters believe that hunters like us, hunting these lions, drive them into extinction. But we're actually not. Because we breed them commercially, we grow those numbers. Well, commercially bred lions contribute to conservation because they take the pressure off of the wild lion herds in the ever-decreasing you know, habitat that they have. And it, and it also encourages the ranch owners to actually breed the lions because the economics of the situation are if an animal doesn't have an economic value, the rancher's not going to grow it. The lion was raised and other lions will be raised for future hunters. 
This is conservation because if it wasn't for the hunter, that lion wouldn't be there. He never would have been bred, never would have been but born. But the lion will inevitably die anyway because it's being hunted. Mm-hmm. But at least it has a purpose in life. Tonight, we'll recognize the hunter conservationist. Our family trip to South Africa set a fire in my heart. I was young, but I wanted to hunt. Everyone gets caught up in life. It's inevitable. But one little hunt, away from the troubles back home, fixes everything. So first off, I'd like to thank everyone who's given me the opportunity to enjoy the outdoors and its many wonders, to travel the world, and harvest some of God's most beautiful creatures. I'm an animal lover, therefore I am a hunter. I realize that wildlife is, is a very precious thing, and I, every hunt that I go on, it's not about the kill. It's about the full experience. It's about getting to know the indigenous people. It's about seeing the wildlife and appreciating them. And then when the time comes to, to hunt and to pursue a certain species, it's the oldest animal, and it's, it's going to die a certain death at some stage. Why not take that Cape buffalo and that meat and give that to the people and enjoy the experience and the adventure and the thrill behind hunting uh, one of God's most incredible creatures and to see that full circle of life and how we play that role in wildlife conservation and humanitarian efforts, that's the greatest reward. It's not about killing an animal, it's about, it's about the experience. And of course, I've seen grown men cry when they shoot it. It's, yeah, you do, you get emotional. That's what, that's what real hunter is. That's the difference between a hunter and a shooter. Hunters don't kill animals because they like to kill things. It's not like we're mass murderers that just enjoy watching things die. Not even, not even remotely like that. It's uh, I, I can't describe it. There's no comparison between hunters and non-hunters because, again, hunters understand animals. That was, that, that's our life. To be a hunter, you have to you have to understand them, you have to appreciate them, you have to know um, things that the, the average public doesn't have a doesn't have a clue. Yeah, I'm an animal lover. I love animals. We have four dogs. <laughs> Why do you guys have the donkeys? Lion takeaway. Lion takeaway. Oh. As soon as we drove up on some of these animals, off, off they went. You know, they would look at us and they'd kind of keep an eye on us and then they said, okay, that's enough. We're out of here. They associate that vehicle with danger. I want him to eat him. Me and you. Yeah. yeah. All right? Maybe it's poison. Oh, OK. We, we must cut well, it. we'll find out, yeah. We must cut it in the half. Yeah, really. OK, so I taste it. All right, here we go. <laughs> mm, it's sweet. Mm? It's like a melon. professional hunter was uh, describing some of his former clients. They had, they had folks who couldn't even hit that target. It was only 50 meters, 50 yards. You know, they couldn't even hit the broadside of a barn. You've got no business being here unless you can, you can handle the weapon properly. All right. Do you guys, do you guys feel comfortable with this? Yes. I just want to go back to the lodge and show you on the lion. On that shot, lion? Oh, yeah. Where, where, where the short placement, where's the, the best short placement? All right.
you can't look at predator breeding and canned hunting without addressing the greater trophy hunting issue. Because at the end of the day, people who come to shoot animals that have been bred on South African farms are still driven by the same issues, and that is the trophy. The nice thing about the ranch lions is they tend to be prettier. They have bigger manes because they've been bred for that. The ranches don't have the thick brush, so the, the wild lions actually live in the brush. And by walking through the brush all the time, it actually rips out their manes. So most wild lions don't have a big, full black mane, for example. I want to select my animal. I'm not able to say that I want a, a lion with a dark mane. It needs, to be a, it needs to have some character. I mean, look at this lion with all the character and all the lines and marks and stuff on it. So where do I get a typical lion like that? I can ask a rancher, do you have a lion like that? And he can tell me, yes, I do, or no, I don't. Going on into Tanzania in an in a, in a open area, I can't do that. I can't select my animal. If I'm a keen trophy hunter and I want to have these on my wall and tell a story about them, I want to be able to select them well. What we call ranch top hunts, you know, th those hunts have, have certainly become more acceptable in today's world. 10, 15 years ago, they were not acceptable to hunt a lion under how fence it was frowned upon. But nowadays it's, it's acceptable because it's a, it's a conservation practice. The way we do it, we've got a eight or 10,000 acre range, we release that lion, or this, we've got a lion that's already released. Um, that's high fenced lion hunting, that's not can hunting. In the interview with the Professional Hunters Association, they spoke very clearly about, we are against canned hunting. So you ask them, well, what is canned hunting? They play with these nuances in the word. So they're against canned hunting, but they're now trying to get into bed with the breeders and our government to cash in. I don't think it's going to stretch anybody's imagination too far to realize that rapidly, and with rare exceptions, all forms of hunting is becoming kind of hunting. These animals do not have infinite space in which to escape. It, it feeds into the whole advertising campaigns which you are seeing at the moment for trophy hunting and trophy hunters is that your kill is guaranteed. I think hunting has changed today because Everything's much faster. The world's a faster place. People don't have time. In a sense, the instant gratification has brought rise to things like the captive bred lion shooting, as we call it. Uh, hunting's not a term I'd use there. I've done a lot of wild lion hunting, but I do know people who've done captive bred lion hunting, and I think that there's an enormous difference. Sadly, what's happening within the hunting industry is that there's the commercialization of hunting. You know, these guys come on a 10-day safari and it's only considered a good hunt if they've shot 15 animals. The captive lion industry and the canned lion industry have actually created a completely new market. The hunter who will go to Tanzania and spend huge amounts of money on a 21-day hunt, knowing that he may not even get that lion, is a totally different market to the market that comes to South Africa, who pays the money for a guaranteed hunt and he can get lion and whatever else he wants. People don't want to go and hunt wild lions and prefer to do these captive bred lions because it's a guarantee. I mean, it's just a slam dunk deal, you're gonna get one. There's a number of professional hunters that feel like we do, who are absolutely disgusted in what's, uh, what's happening with it. And unfortunately, we're the minority. When you confront them, they all talk about how much money they're making, and that these lions 
will one day be put back into, uh, into the wilds and you know, it'll, it'll help the wild lions. We don't see that at all. It is possible to reintroduce lions that were bred and raised in captivity into areas that lions became extinct. The captive lion population might become the savior of the African lion species. Using captive bred lions as, as a source for, for repopulating or supplementing wild populations is just a, it's a bad idea. These animals which have lost their fear of humans, so obviously the likelihood of there being conflict later, um, once individuals have been released into the wild, is that much greater than using a wild individual. Um, they've lost some of their ability to hunt, to basically survive in, in a natural setting and compete against other carnivores. There's also limited territories available in the wild for lions. And if you then put a new male into that group or new females with her cubs, you put those animals that are already in those territories at risk. Any captive animal has absolutely no conservation value whatsoever. And that is particularly true of the captive South African lion population, which is so inbred and, and genetically tarnished that to reintroduce even if it was feasible, those, those captive populations back into the wild would be disastrous. I'm not aware of any captive lions that have, that have made it successfully in the wild. Um, it, it's been trialled numerous occasions, um, probably to the expense of millions of dollars, but it's just, it's not a, a, a viable conservation option. So what do you say to the people who say lions are in danger? I don't know what they're talking about. I don't have the facts. The truth is that lion numbers are going up daily as we speak. Many of the hunters you speak to will even say that the lion populations that they hunt are increasing or at least stable. That's a little bit like saying the world is flat. I mean, or there's no climate change. You design the argument that keeps you doing what you want to do best. If you got a broadside shot, mm -hmm. I want you to shoot the lion here. In the shoulder? In the shoulder. The reason why they were saying shoot them in the shoulder uh, was so that right where the, you would right there is where the heart is. disable yeah, him. So that way he could not charge. If you, if you shoot a, a, a bad shot in this area, mm -hmm. the lion, there's, there's, there's a possibility of more than one shot. Ah. And we want you to kill the lion with one shot. If it happens that a lion end up on one of us, mm -hmm. don't shoot. Uh, Please don't shoot. Always go down on your knees to get the... They wanted you to feel as the lion. that you were in the worst kind of danger. Like you were going to die if you didn't shoot this animal. Always expect the unexpected. Mm -hmm. If the lion charges, don't run, guys. Please, please don't run. These people run. stay close as possible. Yeah, stay. You will be always between, between me and, and Quivers. You, if a lion charges, keep on shooting. Even See when the we lion's run. laying down and the ears back and the tail is wagging. Then yeah. This know. lion is angry. Yeah. Can I, can I take a breath? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah no, uh, um, just be prepared. It, it is a lion. And, oh, yeah. and it's not the same lion. The amount of money that a hunter spends with us, on average, is $20,000 per hunter. On a photographic safari, the average that we can m maybe, in the same amount of time, get from a guy taking photographs, maybe $2,000. So 10 times more money from the hunter than from a photographic safari guy. So the economics is there on the hunter side. We talk about sustainable use and we talk about the wise use movement. I think they've both been hijacked. I mean, those terms I don't think were originally intended to represent a kind of opportunity for people to, you know, trophy hunt or to carry out sporting, sporting activities. You cannot stop hunting ever. 
because it puts a value on the animal. It makes it worthwhile. I'm not big on doing partial solutions. And so the decision was made that we would do a ban of hunting on all concessions. When you look at the number of lions that Africa had and what we have today, it speaks for itself. The argument comes, we'll breed to keep hunting. Well, you know, if you want to go along those lines, you, you may as well adopt the attitude and say, you will never see lion other than a caged lion and it's sustainable. Is that the right thing? I don't think so. They've had 20 years now to look at the two land use options side by side. And they've made a very rational decision based on conservation, economics, and benefits to the communities and the government by comparing the two. So you don't have to get involved in ethical debates, moral debates, philosophical debates. They have the comparison. And for them, photographic tourism is far more beneficial than trophy hunting. Tourists who come here to hunt, they are of great value to our tourism sector. As long as, you know, as, long as the hunting that they do doesn't negatively impact on the reputation of the rest of the sector. If trophy hunting can contribute positively to the conservation effort, it, it, it should be retained and, and it should be done in such a way that it is understood and appreciated by the public, including tourists who want to visit South Africa for the safari experience. The tourism industry in South Africa is worth around about 95 billion a year. So it's a sizable industry and it's a big chunk of our total GDP. Of that, the hunting industry is about 1.5%. So it's a very, very small portion of the revenue. And then the canned lion hunting industry is a portion of that. One in seven South Africans is directly dependent on the tourism industry to put food on their table. And my concern about the canned lion industry is that it potentially can damage brand South Africa in such a bad way. Why risk brand South Africa and its reputation and the livelihoods of one in seven South Africans for the benefit of a few individuals. I think it has already damaged brand South Africa. How significantly, I'm not really able to tell. But the, the practice of canned lion hunting or breeding in captivity comes with a lot of negativity. And therefore, it, it does and probably will do further reputational damage unless we take some more decisive measures to discourage it. The one thing that I would say to, to anybody about our lions is that they are better off being seen with our eyes. We don't want to kill them. If we, if we look at them with our eyes and leave them and appreciate them, for me, that is the way. You know, it's the right to life. And I will speak for those that don't have a voice. We need to be radical as far as protecting our, our wildlife species, our fauna and flora and the environment. We don't have second chances on any of those. The very essence of what the hunting industry says they are about, and that is being in the wild, pursuit of this wild animal. It's putting your skills against a wild creature. Breeding these animals in confined areas on the farms, all they're doing is they're domesticating them. Are they saying that they're actually coming now to shoot domesticated lions? Hunting is not what it pretends to be. All about conservation, no effect on breeding stocks, on the genetic value, bringing money back into communities. It doesn't do any of those things. It's all about somebody going out there and having fun killing a lion. The bush is but difficult. We're gonna shoot in a, in a short distance. It will be in 50 to 30 yards. 50 meters. Okay, so sure. about what I just yeah. did. Yeah, yeah. About you, you won't I, shoot. Maybe a little bit closer. Yeah, you will shoot closer than what you've done now. Wow. Yeah. The um, tracker will be will be also there. And Eric's, Eric's the tracker, the, right? The, yeah, no, no, uh, the, the black guy. He oh. used to tracker for us. Okay. And, and the two cameramen right behind us. Fra, fra, ek fra, is hierdie vir a TV onderhoud? Of for what newspaper is that? 
that's a cock, yes, I be a second to them. What are you really I'll doing? Kill you. Is this I'll, I'll kill you. I'll kill you. Don't take a photo of me. No, I'll no, fucking no, kill sorry, you. Sorry, sorry. I'll, sorry, kill, you. Just, I'll kill you. Yeah, I'll tell you. I warned you. Yes. Don't take a photo of me. So you must write a note and sign that is not for a TV or for a newspaper or anything like that. Scrape. Scrape off. Where are the Off. Eight for the hack. Or otherwise out. What? Do it Sorry, now. what? 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 I don't understand. What? What? Shut your fucking back. Sorry? Shut, shut. Blister. I don't understand. What happened? What are you saying? happened is what will happen. What do you mean, what will happen? What? Schrijf it down. Here is what you have to do for the United States. Schrijf, or otherwise, out. Huh? This, this is not good. All right, let me explain. Put it off, please. Sorry? To put it off. Just, okay. just turn it, just turn it, it off. Okay. Uh, the people come from behind us, the greenies. And they come with, with all the bad uh, pub, pub, uh, publicity. And uh, they come and send people to, 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 to make photos. That's why, uh, that's oh. why, uh, I don't. I, I'm. I'm. A, I'm upset here, guys. You know, I, I'm. I'm not happy there. This. This. These are my friends. All right. Uh, I, I understand. Sir. Are you no? I'm not happy. Huh? Are what? you not happy? Uh, what? what do you say? Are you not happy? Be because you're treating. Are you not of happy? You tr you, you're treating my friends this way. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't understand. If you're not happy, tell me now. Then we are finished. We're finished. Uh, yeah. Then you go out. Yeah. If you're not happy, tell me now. All right. Oh, let's let's let's, let's knock off. I think that's as far as I was willing to push this. We're on our way out, and uh, farther away we get, the better I feel. Even after I pulled the plug, they were still. You know, can you give us any extra time? I will say we can two, three, three hours, hours, two, three hours, two, three hours, but then we must, then we must go, and then there's only one way: spot with the with the vehicle, get off, and and do the shooting. I will say maximum three hours. Then you can be on the road. The folks who come here, knowing these animals are in an enclosure, knowing these animals have been hand raised, and yet still pull that trigger. It's not a real hunt. Right from the beginning, the idea was that he was never ever gonna shoot the lion, but we certainly needed to go through the process to find out what happens on these properties, what they're about. It's going to be a, a, a difficult battle to close captive breeding and can hunting. There's no doubt about that. I don't know how, honestly, the South African government is going to be able to tackle this, but ultimately they are responsible because it's the lack of regulation in the early days or the lack of, of, of law preventing canned hunting from developing in the very early days that has allowed proliferation to the point where now, we're not talking of a few hundred animals in captivity, which would be a huge challenge anyway. We're talking of six to 8,000 lions in captivity in these canned hunting facilities. What are you gonna do? You're gonna create sanctuaries. Are you going to then sterilize every last one of them? Personally, I think the whole lot should be euthanized. And however terrible that might sound, what is their value to us today, honestly? You know, euthanasia is, is, is the quickest um, short-term solution. But if the government and the conservation authorities were really serious about
closing down the captive breeding industry. Then to institute a ban on, on captive breeding would, would see the natural death of, of breeding farms. Our first step is to be in one mind as a country about whether we want this. Is this something that we feel proud of as a nation? My feeling is I'm not proud of it. If you're very proud about our continent, about our community, about our animals, only then can we protect it. I think we should consider stronger measures to control, if not to ban breeding of lions in captivity, because we simply don't need it in terms of our conservation effort. When we talk about demand reduction, we are talking about turning off the taps of those people who are coming to buy the trophy hunts. I can't have this discussion in South Africa. The trophy hunting industry mostly are on sides with these breeders and these hunters. The best way then to, to tackle issues is to go outside the country and hit the problem at source. Already since that trip to Switzerland and, and Finland, I've had feedback from the UK, from Holland, from people who are now interested in taking up this issue. I want to announce that Australia is committing to be a leader in ending the insidious practice of canned hunting. I have signed an order to prevent the importation into Australia of African lion parts and remains. This order will take effect immediately. It is part of the global movement to end canned hunting forever. If the hunter cannot bring his trophy home, you'll find out very quickly what this industry is about. You know, clearly of the great evils you can imagine in the world, putting a wild, at heart, predator into a confined area is one of them. Then, selling a safari hunt to shoot it is another. I think we have to regain the moral high ground on this. We have to recapture the term uh, wise use and sustainable use, and we have to reinterpret it for the world that we wish to see rather than the world that we currently inhabit. Well, we're at that tipping point. We had better decide what we want to do. Up until a few years ago, we referred to lions as lions. This country, this industry, has ensured now that we have to differentiate. We have to talk about wild lions. Five, six, seven years ago, I mean, all lions were wild. What kind of a legacy is that? Part of what we need to achieve is to get off our pedestal as this superior, arrogant, exploitative species and embrace our participation in this magnificent community of life. Nowhere else in the universe have we found any life at all, let alone the kind of incredible community that we've been born into. And the fact that we choose to devastate it is a fundamental error. And stopping that will start with things like stopping canned hunting. Some hunters do lay down their weapons. Mm. Why do you think they do that? It has something to do with the look in the eye of the animal. And for the first time, that hunter sees himself in the eye of that other. And I think it is the beginnings of seeing everything in life differently after you put down that gun. When you stop trying to prove, when you stop trying to demonstrate control, when you stop trying to to demonstrate dominance in a world where you're, in fact, pretty small and damned lucky to be alive. It is in the animal gaze that your spur becomes uncertain. That who you are is shaken. 
It is in the eye of the prey that the shift of skin takes place. If the barrel points the other way, and you find yourself hunting in a new country. Mm-hmm. <laughs>